Well, that was Mark Urban. I want to discuss how the shutdown's playing out politically for President Trump. We're joined by Mika Mosbacher, part of the Advisory Committee for President Trump's 2020 re-election campaign, and Brian Klaas, the Assistant Professor of Global Politics and a columnist for the Washington um, Post. If I can go straight to you, Mika, first of all. Um, it was the blue-collar workers that we remember most as being so fervently behind Trump. Are they still? Would you have sympathy uh, for them if they weren't after this? Well, first of all, I have sympathy, and so does the president, for every American who is going at, without a paycheck. Most Americans live paycheck to paycheck. I have family members who are suffering. But that is more reason why it is imperative that the Democratic leadership come to the table. On Saturday, President Trump put forth a very fair compromise uh, based on bipartisan discussions and gave Democrats many concessions, including a three-year temporary uh, uh, pr process for the mm. DACA recipients in the United States, as well as $800 million for technology, in addition to uh, additional personnel and medical and humanitarian Make response. And the issue is, is that the Democrats could meet in the middle and they could negotiate and it could be a win-win on both sides. Unfortunately, the Democrats refused to come to the table uh, and Nancy Pelosi has taken a hard-line position. Know, Mika, and so it's just... like really negotiating <laughs> with a brick wall. Well, I'm going to put that to Brian. I, I know we're not going to solve the shutdown here on Newsnight tonight. No. Politically, you would accept that President Trump is the one taking the hit, that it is his ratings that have now been hit by this crisis, not the Democrats. No, I would not, because I look at fundraising, not polling, and the campaign launched a website on Friday uh, asking individuals to purchase fake bricks to send to either Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer, and we broke fundraising levels. Wow. I feel the base <laughs> is still sticking with him, and I think that that is something that is very significant. Okay, let me put these it to are Brian. small dollar donors. Right, dollar donors and fake bricks. Wall is being built somehow in fundraising. So does it mean that they're still behind Trump? Well, the base is, uh, but the, you're absolutely right that the polls show that he's not. I mean, clinging on to this idea that people are buying fake bricks and that shows that Trump is winning, when the polls show him slipping not just with Americans but with his, his core base. I mean, we have polls out today that well, show... Well, who's putting the money in then, Brian? Well, there are people. I mean, there's enough people yeah, to send exactly. money. There's certainly enough people to send money that are part of Trump's core base. He's still got 35% of the public. I mean, that's a lot of people in the United States. It's also historically unpopular. The polls out today show his approval rating between 30 34 and 38 percent, which is one of the lowest ratings of any president in American history. And beyond that, he's losing support among his base. Among Republicans, 76 percent approve of him. Among people in the U.S. who look at the shutdown, more than two-thirds or roughly two-thirds say Trump is at fault compared to a much smaller minority who said that Pelosi or the Democrats are at fault. So he is taking the blame for this. And by the way, this is not me saying this. We, we played the, you played the clip in the intro to this. Trump said, I will take the, the, the blame. I will not blame you for this. I will take the mantle and I will shut down the government. Right. And Americans are taking him as word on that. So, so Mika, uh, politically... Well, polling was wrong. Well, let, let me just polling come back to your point. Polling was wrong in 2016. Mika, let me just come back to your point, which was, you know, why aren't the Democrats at the table compromising? And surely the answer is exactly. he lost... He lost the House in the midterms, and if he needs to do one thing, it's triangulate now with the people who, who now have control of it. He needs to reach out to them. He did with his fair and reasonable compromise on Saturday when he gave his Oval Office address. You know, the fact that we're seeing a vote on Thursday, tomorrow at about 2.30 in the Senate shows there's some movement there. But I'm also seeing some cracks in the Democrats. The number two Democrat in the House, uh, Representative Hoyer, has indicated that he's willing to negotiate and support some sort of sub, uh, border security, including a barricade in areas of the border that the Customs and B Border Patrol deem Brian, essential. Don't... So I think that, that Nancy Pelosi has a problem, especially with this ridiculous conversation about her holding hostage right. the State of the okay. Union address, which is a time-honored tradition <laughs> Let's in get country. into that. Uh, don't the Democrats have more mileage to gain by being the brokers, by being the grown-ups, instead of playing this, yeah. you took away my private jet, I'm taking away your right to make a speech in the House? I mean, that, that's not what you want. Want to be. No, but I mean, the shutdown exactly. was they something, <laughs> sorry if I could finish, the, the shutdown is something that Trump 
started, right? He, the, the Republicans in the Senate voted for what's called a continuing resolution, which is keeping funding levels at current levels, unanimously, 100 to 0 in, in December. It, it was going to pass the House as well. And then Trump said, actually, I'm not going to sign it. Now all that's needed for the government to reopen is Republicans in the Senate need to vote for a bill that they've already voted for. They don't need Trump. There is a constitutional a, a mechanism to overrule the president when they have a veto-proof majority. 100 to 0, by the way, doesn't take much of math to do this, is more than the two-thirds veto-proof majority. So, you know, if they can open the government and then negotiate. And when we talk about the wall's effectiveness, there's three quick statistics I want to bring into this because they're very important. One is that net migration between the U.S. and Mexico is negative. Since 2011, more people have been leaving the U.S. to go to Mexico than the reverse. In 2017, the second statistic, there were fewer border apprehensions and fewer illegal crossings at any point since 1971. So mm -hmm. to paint this as a crisis is just a lie. Okay. And, and the final one that I wanted to say is that two-thirds of the illegal immigration growth is coming from visa overstays. So unless the wall is 33,000 feet tall, it's not going to do much to stop that massive influx so, of illegal immigrants. So, Mika, once again, we're talking about immigration, we're talking about Mexico, we're talking about the border wall. These are all um, core Trump areas. There is a train of thought that... He loves this standoff because it stops people from concentrating on the Mueller, on the Russian investigation, on the things that he really doesn't want to be facing right now. Mika. No, he took an oath to protect the American people, and he's putting their protection first. While there was a slight dip in border crossings in 2018, in November and December, it spiked. And what is happening is the composite is different. Instead of just single males coming across the border, we have families. We have, according to the 2017 report from Doctors Without Borders, that some of these women making these crossings are subject to sexual assault. This is a humanitarian crisis in addition to the fact that for, uh, drugs are pouring in. Yes, they're pouring okay. in through the ports of entry. But if we have a wall, we can reallocate manpower so that we can better detect the drugs coming in on cargo trucks. Thank you both so very much. So it's a multi-tiered process. Thank you. Thank you for coming.